The Picks, a story by Tyre de Chardin from his book, Hymn of the Universe. As I listened to my friend, my heart began to burn within me, and my mind awoke to a new and higher vision of things. I began to realize vaguely that the multiplicity of evolutions into which the world process seems to us to be split up is in fact fundamentally the working out of one single great mystery. And this first glimpse of light caused me, I know not why, to tremble in the depths of my soul. But I was so accustomed to separating reality into different planes and categories of thought that I soon found myself lost in this spectacle. Still new and strange to my tyro mind of a cosmos in which the dimensions of divine reality of spirit and of matter were also intimately mingled. Seeing that I was waiting anxiously for further enlightenment, my friend went on. The last story I would like to tell you uh, concerns an experience which happened to me recently. This time, as you'll see, it was not just a question of vision properly so-called, it was a more general impression which affected me and still affects my whole being. This is what happened. At that time, my regiment was in line on the Avocourt Plateau. The German attack on Verdun was still going on and fighting was heavy on this side of the Moose. So, like many priests during battle, I was carrying on me the Eucharistic species in a little pyx shaped like a watch. One morning, when there was an almost complete lull in the trenches, I went down into my dugout, and there, as I withdrew into a sort of meditation, my thoughts very naturally turned to the treasure I was carrying on me. With nothing but the thin gilt of the picks between it and my breast. Many times already I had derived joy and sustenance from the fact of this divine presence. But this time a new idea dawned on me, which soon drove out all other preoccupations, whether of recollection or of adoration. I suddenly realized just how extraordinary and how disappointing it was to be thus holding so close to oneself the wealth of the world and the very source of life without being able to possess it inwardly, without being able to either to penetrate it or to assimilate it. How could Christ be at once so close to my heart and so far from it, so closely united to my body and so remote from my soul? I had the feeling that an intangible but invincible barrier separated me from him with whom nevertheless I could hardly be in closer contact since I was holding him in my hands. I fretted at the thought of holding my happiness in a sealed receptacle. I was reminded of a bee buzzing round a pot filled with nectar but tightly closed, and impatiently I pressed the picks against me. As though this instinctive action could cause Christ to enter more deeply into me, Finally, feeling I could not continue thus any longer, and it being now the hour when I usually said Mass when things were quiet, I opened the picks and gave myself Holy Communion. But now, it seemed to me that in the depths of my being, though the bread I had just eaten had become flesh of my flesh, nevertheless it remained outside of me. I then summoned to my aid all my powers of recollection. I concentrated on the divine particle, the deepening silence and the mounting love of my mind and heart. I made myself limitlessly humble, as docile and tractable as a child, so as not to run counter in any way the least desires of my heavenly guest, but to make myself indistinguishable from him. And through my submission to him, to become one with the members of the physical organism which his soul so completely directed. I went on and on without respite, trying to purify my heart so as to make my inmost being ever most transparent to the light which I was sheltering within me. Vain yet blessed attempt. 
Still, the host seemed to be always ahead of me, always further on in a more complete concentration and opening out of my desires, further on in a greater permeability of my being to the divine influences, further on in a more absolute limpidity of my affective powers. But my withdrawal into myself and my continual purification of my being I was penetrating ever more deeply into it. But I was like a stone that rolls down a precipice without ever reaching the bottom. Tiny though the host was, I was losing myself in it without ever being able to grasp it or to coincide with it. Its center was receding from me as it drew me on. Since I could never reach the inmost, inmost depth of the host, it struck me that I might at least manage to grasp it by its whole surface, for that surface was very smooth and very small. I tried, therefore, to coincide with it externally, to correspond exactly to its contours, but there was a new affinity that awaited me, which dashed my hopes. When I tried to envelop the sacred particle in my love so jealously that I clung to it without losing an atom's breadth of precious content with it, what happened was, in effect, that each touch produced a new differentiation, a new complexity, so that each time I thought to have encompassed it, I found that what I was holding was not the host at all, but one or other of the thousand entities which make up our lives, a suffering, a joy, a task, a friend, a love, or to console. Thus, in the depths of my heart, through a marvelous substitution. The host was eluding me by means of its own service and leaving me at grips with the entire universe which had reconstituted itself and drawn itself forth from its sensible appearances. I will not dwell on the feeling of rapture produced in me by this revelation of the universe placed between Christ and myself like a magnificent prey I will only say, returning to that special impression of exteriority which had initiated the vision, that I now understood the nature of the invisible barrier which stood between the picks and myself. From the host which I held in my fingers, I was separated by the full extent and the density of the years which still remained to me to be lived and to be divinized. Here, my friend hesitated a moment. Then he added, I don't know why it is, but for some time now I have had the impression, as I hold the host in my hands, that between it and me there remains only a thin, barely formed film. I had, he went on, I had always been by temperament a pantheist. I had always felt the pantheist yearnings to be native to me and unarguable, but had never dared give full rein to them because I could not see how to reconcile them with my faith. Now, since these various experiences and others as well, I can affirm that I have found my interest in my existence inexhaustible and my peace indestructible. I live at the heart of a single unique element, the center of the universe and present in each part of it personal love and cosmic power. To attain to him and become merged into his life, I have before me the entire universe with its noble struggles, its impassioned quest, its myriads of souls to be healed and made perfect. I can and I must throw myself into the thick of human endeavor and with no stopping for breath. For the more, fu more fully I play my part and the more I bring my efforts to bear on the whole surface of reality, the more also will I attain to Christ and cling close to him. God, who is eternal being in itself, is, one might say, everywhere in process or of formation for us. And God is also the heart of everything and so much so that the vast setting of the universe might be engulfed or wither away or be taken from me by death without my joy being diminished. 
we're creation's dust which is vitalized by a halo of energy and glory to be swept away the substantial reality wherein every perfection is incorruptibly contained and possessed would remain intact the rays would be drawn back into their source and there I should still hold them all in a close embrace. This is why even war does not disconcert me. In a few days' time, we shall be thrown into battle for the recapture of Dumont, a grandiose, almost a fantastic exploit, which will mark and symbolize a definitive advance of the world in the liberation of souls. And I tell you this, I shall go into this engagement in a religious spirit, with all my soul borne on by a single great impetus in which I am unable to distinguish where human emotions end and adoration begins. And if I am destined not to return from those heights, I would like my body to remain there, molded into the clay of the fortifications, like a living cement thrown by God, into the stonework of the new city. Thus, my dear friend spoke to me one October evening. He whose soul was instinctively in communion with the life, the one life of all reality and whose body rests now as he wished somewhere in the wild countryside around Theomont. Written on October 14th, 1916, before the engagement at Dumont. Pierre Tire de Chardin.